David, thanks for joining us. You've worked for a number of years in sports law and represented various sports men and women. When did you realise that doping was such a large scale issue? Well, I think it really hit in 1988 when Ben Johnson was found positive in uh, the Olympic Games in Seoul. Uh, and that was the moment that really captured probably most people in the world who were really interested in sport and wanted to see it to be clean. And the subsequent inquiry from the Canadians led to all sorts of things, including in New Zealand the establishment of a national anti-doping agency. And I was asked to help that occur, uh, and I did so. Uh, in doing that, we had a lot of visits, I suppose, to Australia because they had a model in place. Uh, and so I learned the Australian model as well. And from there it went from pillar to post, so to speak. Anti-doping as an industry, if we can call it that, is relatively new. How challenging has it been over the last 12 years to confront the main issues? Well, look, I think some say we have created an industry just by our mere being and the fact that we've looked at trying to improve rules and in so doing uh, led to all sorts of new positions or new activities. Look, I think every day is a challenge in, in this sort of job and when you are dealing with breaches of integrity, when you are having to make uh, decisions or comments about people who have broken rules and have cheated. Uh, it's not easy. On the other hand, if you have the respect for the rules and the respect for the clean athlete, uh, it's a job which you feel must be uh, carried out and must be maintained to the highest level. Uh, so from that point of view, I don't feel the challenges, I feel uh, the responsibilities and I think uh, all of us here uh, in our office and our offices around the world feel that responsibility and I should say respond to it. Some would say there's a conflict of interest issue between a sport or country protecting its brand and, and having to confront the, the doping issue in its own backyard. What would you say to this? Well, that, that's where we come into it. So we are the people who are responsible to monitor those signatories to our code to ensure that they're carrying out their job in the best possible fashion according to the rules. Uh, and so we are the seal of approval, if you like, and, and we must carry out that job uh, not only globally but also professionally. And, and that's the area where I think we overcome that initial perception of conflict that will never disappear because if you are running your program for your own sport and you are conducting the result management for that program, there will be times when people say they didn't do it fairly or properly. We have to come over the top of that and say, yes, they did, or no, they didn't, and, and, and that's our job. Since you became Director General, there have been three revisions of the World Anti-Doping Code. How much has been learnt during that time, and, and how improved is the current code? Well, I think we learn on uh, on, on rules on a daily basis and I think uh, we have uh, got to the position where we ask our signatories to tell us how these rules can be practiced effectively. So each time we've conducted a revision we've gone out and said you tell us, you tell us how the rules can be made better, we'll listen to you and we'll compile the revisions according to your wishes or your desires. Uh, we have to have consensus so there will be, from time to time, minority views which are not expressed in, in those revisions. Now we think we've got a really good set of rules. That's fantastic. But for them to be effective, they have to be practised to the same level of excellence. And to do that globally uh, will, will really require a major effort on behalf of all our, all our signatories. You talk about collaboration and, and partnerships. How much more stressed is that now under the new rules than it was in previous years? How much do we need to work together to defeat this problem? Well, I think we've always had to work together. I, I don't know if we've expressed it that way too, too often. We've always been seen as the bad guys telling all the good guys what to do. And I think we've tried to change that atmosphere by saying, hey, we're all in this together. To do better, we need to work together. For you guys to succeed, you need us to help you succeed because we've got expertise and experience and so on. And for us to succeed, we need your support. So everybody needs to muck in, everybody needs to work out the role that they play, and as you say, in partnership, we can achieve stuff that we couldn't achieve alone. Looking a little more closely at the current World Anti-Doping Code, how much of an answer does it provide to the doping issue? Well, it only provides a portion of it, because uh, once you've got that set of rules, um, you then need to work out how they're going to be implemented in practice. 
Uh, you need to have people who will carry those rules out, and so you rely on the values and the commitment of those individual people. Uh, and at the end of the day, you're only as good as the people that are running the programs. Uh, they have to have, I think, not only commitment to seek level playing fields for the athletes, uh, but also the high values and the high integrity that we think we show and we would like others to uh, reveal. So there's a lot of human uh, sort of aspects to the whole anti-doping program that really need to be consistent. You've talked before about anti-doping being so much more than just testing. We have, of course, the athlete biological passport, what we call non-analytical evidence. Tell me a little bit about how all these pieces form the puzzle. Uh, you know, when we started, it was only testing. And really, when we started, it was only urine testing, but a little bit of blood. Uh, so from a, from a gathering of human uh, samples, it's, it's created uh, a system now where we collect more blood than we did at the outset, some of which was introduced for the athlete biological passport in its early stages, some of which is now used in terms of detection of some of the prohibited substances, including human growth hormone and so on. So there's been quite a lot of progress in testing samples, bodily samples. The other side of it, really started to develop in 2003 when the Balco situation hit the fan and in that uh, brief moment when it was a, probably over a few months we started to realise that evidence to show cheating is not just available through collecting samples and we commenced uh, a program really way back in the early 2000s to build on the Balco experience and to say hey this is what you can do work with your police work with your customs people, work with other people who are already in existence within your country, who can gather information. Let's see if that can be brought together to form enough evidence to sanction an individual for breaking the rules. Uh, and that's been a considerable uh, advance, if you like. And now, I think in the RISE code, there are 10 ways you can be subject to a alleged breach. Two of them are from sample collection and the rest are for non-analytical cases. And that just shows, I think, the, uh, the intensity, if you like, of the issue, the way it is growing. I'm not sure how far it will go and how fast it will grow, because in many countries you really need laws in place to give the powers to people to collect evidence legally or effectively. Uh, and that's going to depend country to country, because they have the ability to make rules that we don't interfere with. It's their sovereignty and it's their right to determine what's best for their population. But as we ourselves get involved in an investigation, we can see that there's a lot that you need to know and a lot you need to have by way of retained information or stored information, uh, which might help. You've spoken before about the importance of law enforcement working together with the anti-doping community. And in fact, we saw it recently with a substance DNP come to light. Tell us a little bit more about how this works in practice. It's very difficult to say how th things happen on a daily basis because they don't. But what we've got with Interpol, for example, is a relationship where we have a person who was seconded to Interpol by the French government to partake as a specially designated officer in the field of anti-doping. His task, because he is aware that the criminal underworld is very much involved in the trafficking of steroids and so on, is to stop that happening but to talk to us about what we know so that he can then work on the information we give him. On the other hand, he learns information from conducting inquiries or investigations with that data. So it's an exchange of information on a regular basis. As far as the DMP thing was concerned, of course, there, was a, there were a couple of deaths which sparked that off, people who died from ingesting this substance. Interpol got involved through reports to them from local police. Uh, the concern was such that they came to us and said, uh, we're concerned, are you guys? We said, of course we are, this is, this is shocking, uh, and we need to do something about it. So uh, that's the sort of way in which you can gather information or share it and use it to probably better outcomes than you could if you just did it yourself. You've spoken at length in the past about doping being an issue beyond elite sports. It's seeping into public health, being a public health issue gym consumption by, by young athletes and also those of older gen generations who want to remain young, if you like. Tell us a little bit about this concern. Well, for some time we've been aware that the issue uh, in elite 
sport is not an elite sport issue only. Um, it's very obvious from the availability of steroids, from the way in which it's being tra- they've been trafficked, from the, in- the huge amount of profit that can be made from those who are selling or distributing them, that the criminal world is going to get involved. Not only do they get involved, they get involved in countries where it's not illegal to do so, so therefore there's no risk. And the target is, is obviously mass production or mass distribution. So who are the likely people to be involved in those who will be subject to the sales pitch? The young people, particularly those in high school or 15, 16, 17, that sort of age bracket where they don't talk to their parents about it a lot. Uh, they take a lot of stuff on the street, whether it's steroids or other stuff. Uh, they ingest it without inquiring where it came from and so on. Then you've got the second category of individual who is at your local gymnasia, partaking in probably uh, trying to look good. And the quick way to get there is by taking steroids. And so the guy in the corner of the room is the guy who supplies that quick way. People love that person because nowadays people would prefer to take the shortcut than the the long route. So there's a second cabal, if you like, of, of available clients to the trafficker. Of the last three or four years, you've added a variety of people, and that's the, the old guys who want to visit the fountain of youth and want to live a bit longer and live a bit better. And the whole peptide industry is, is providing for them. So that's another layer that has come, just as I say, in the last four or five years. Now, when you look at all that, that's a huge bulk of your population outside of your elite athletes. What are the main priorities for WADA and the anti-doping community at large in the months and years ahead? Well, I think you've got to start with the athletes. So the, the major thing, I, I think, for us at all time is to remember that we are here to ensure that the clean athletes, and there's quite a lot of them, more than 90%, get the level playing field thereafter. And our job is to ensure that those, therefore, who are precluding them from getting that are kicked out of sport. And we must remember that. We've got 90 plus percent behind us and we must use that effectively to ensure that those in the minority stop cheating. And if they are cheating and they're found out that they're properly sanctioned. That's, that's a really strong issue for us and it's a challenge uh, because uh, some people want the superstars, even although they have been cheating, to continue to succeed. That's number one. Number two is to make sure that in doing that we have the most effective mechanisms whether that be gathering information and using the non-analytical route to stop people, or whether it's making sure that our science improves to such a degree that those who are cheating are found out by sample analysis. The third level, which probably might be second in some people's minds, is education. To ensure that through proper education and informing of the young athletes of the world that they're not even tempted to cheat and therefore don't take the risk when it is put in front of them uh, later in their, in their sporting careers. But to affect that education, we've got to remember that the really good athletes are no longer alone. There's a whole raft of people who can influence an athlete in his or her decision-making process. And part of what we need to make sure we're doing is get to those people and make sure they share the values that we all share, make sure they know the risks that will come to their special athlete, friend or or member of the family, so that the risks are not taken. Now that's a huge undertaking, just looking at that bundle of of issues. And for us as a small organisation, we've got to remember that, we actually punch well above our weight, but we've got to continue to aspire to punch even higher. And, And in doing that, achieve things that haven't been achieved to date. And I think as we go forward, that's that would be my hope of of the aspiration of this agency. How does that values-based education, the preventative message, cut through to the younger generations when you've got huge amounts of dollars at stake when they become a professional athlete? Well, that's the temptation you've got to be aware of. And, And what I keep saying to our team here, to actually succeed in getting that message across, you've got to think like the bad guys. Because there will always be cheaters. There will always be one, one or two or three or four out there who want to take the shortcut to success. We can't beat them all but you can certainly reduce the number who are tempted to cheat. What words of encouragement would, would you give to anti-doping organisations to really motivate them? Well, I think that's the biggest challenge of the lot because each country has different 
base values. Each, each country has different issues that they have to deal with in addition to, to matters of doping. Uh, and so you've got to bear that in mind even when you start thinking about how to encounter it. So there's not one answer. There, there's several answers and there's several ways of going about it, adhering to local culture, local language and, and all sorts of messaging issues, as well as understanding the way in which those cultures operate on a daily basis. There are some where betting is rife. There are some where corruption is, is more than you would have anticipated. So working within those environments, you've got to say, so how do we succeed? Many others are trying. Are we going to get in where they have not succeeded? Be realistic. So the way in which we are conducting some of those messaging is through regional anti-doping agencies, through the way in which we look at uh, the issue on a continental basis, and don't just stay in our office and treat it like an ivory tower and preach to people. We've got to get down and dirty, basically. Many people would refer to doping as a cat and mouse game. You have the, the dopers and you have the regulators. Who's winning now? Look, I don't think it's a, a question of, of winning or losing. I think it's a question of who has an edge. Uh, and from time to time, I think we've had an edge. Uh, at other times, I think the cheating individuals who surround uh, athletes and tempt the athletes to cheat are also getting an edge. And that's because you're always going to get in a society where the rewards are so high, the money is so big, people will take risks. You're not going to get rid of the problem. You're going to try to eradicate as many of those who are committing the problem. Uh, but success at the end of the day has got to be measured by how effective your programs are. And that means at least getting some of the major cheaters. Uh, they are battles that have to be waged. Uh, and battles that have to be fought with some intensity to ensure that you uh, do eradicate some of the major cheaters. But when it comes to the cat and mouse, you know, as I say, sometimes you're the cat, sometimes you feel as though you're the mouse. We're hearing more and more about other sporting illnesses, if you like, match fixing, illegal betting. How does doping ensure it's still front page or back page news and it's still the main concern in sport? Well, I don't think, I don't think anyone of those issues ought to be the main concern. I think all, all of those amount to challenges against the integrity of sport and all have got to be looked at as to, so what do you do about them? You can do something about doping in a way that we've already shown can be done because you can collect samples and you can analyse them. You can gather evidence about doping in the same way as you can gather evidence about match fixing. So you start putting together all of these challenges to integrity into one bundle. And I would say the best way forward, and some governments are doing this already, is to put them together and say, how are you going to address them with the same people that you've got addressing them, but using different techniques according to the challenge? David Howman, thank you very much. Thank you, Ben.